Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our chapel speaker today is Dr. Willie Bolden. Dr. Willie Bolden serves as the Executive Director of Community and Church Relations at our DTS Houston campus. This administrative faculty position started July 1, 2012. Dr. Bolden is a graduate of Biola University and Talbot Seminary in California. He is also a graduate of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he completed a Doctor of Ministry degree in Missions and Evangelism. He serves as an adjunct professor at several schools, but his primary teaching love is in the classroom in our own pastoral ministries department on the DTS campus in Houston. After planting two churches in California, Willie came to DeSoto, Texas, and founded These Are They Community Church, where he served as the senior pastor for nearly 20 years. He is also the founder of W.J. Bolden Ministries. Willie and his lovely wife, Loretta, have seven children. Loretta is here today because I hugged her neck. Where did she move? There she is. Loretta, would you please stand so that we may recognize you? On a personal note, I've known Dr. Bolden for over 20 years and had the privilege of teaching alongside of him at conferences and conventions. And I have come to love the fine folks at These Are They Community Church. He has helped me learn the biblical power of reconciliation and what it means to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a broken world. Willie, thank you and welcome to the DTS team. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Willie Bolden as our chapel speaker today. I want to first take this opportunity to thank Dr. Yarbrough and, of course, Dr. Bailey, my colleagues on the roster. Special thanks to uh, my teammates that are watching this live in Houston, and for several of our, my teammates that are here this morning. I need to get something out of the way real quickly just to kind of put me at ease. I've been preaching for over 30 years. But 30 years ago, I had a dream of preaching in this place. It's a dream that is now being realized. And if you hear something that sounds like uh, a noise, it's my knees <laughs> clanging together in fear and trepidation. This is intimidating. I don't know how you guys do it. I'm hoping this will be my last time. <laughs> Would you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for such an awesome opportunity. Father, we ask that you would stand up in me and that you would be clearly revealed. Your word teaches us that if Christ is lifted up, he would draw men to himself. Help me to lift up my Savior. Speak to the hearts that need to be encouraged. Speak to the hearts that may be leaning to a wrong direction. But most of all, when we leave, May we leave with the saying on our lips, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Over the years, the Lord has given me many opportunities to share the gospel from one coast to the other in all types of conferences and venues. But I remember one opportunity sharing the gospel. In Compton, California, I had the opportunity to talk to a very prominent gang member in that city. I don't know how much you know about Compton, California, but there's a known gang there, pretty powerful gang. 
And this guy was a part of that very powerful game. The Lord gave me an opportunity to talk to him about Christ. And after I talked to him about Christ, what was quite interesting is what he said to me. And if you would allow me, I want to say it exactly as he said it to me. And I want to even say it in the way that he said it to me. Here's what he said. Preacher, you don't understand. I ain't got no problem with Christ. He died for my sins and rose again from the dead. Preacher, my problem is with Christians. My problem is with churches. That's the reason why I don't go. Now, obviously, he misunderstood what I was trying to do. I was trying to talk to him about his personal relationship with Jesus and how there seemed to be um, a difference between what he was saying and how he was living being a part of a gang. But at the same time, I understood his point. Here's what he was saying. There seems to be a disconnect between the message that is preached and the lifestyle of the messengers who preach it. So what I want to talk to you about this morning, I want to speak from this theme, the merging of the message and the messengers. Because I wonder, did this gang member make this statement to me because he had seen many of our shortcomings as men and women of faith? Did he make this statement because he um, constantly was uh, hearing about all of the failures and the mishaps of those in the, many, in the ministry? I don't have to tell you that it seems like this day, every time we turn around, we're hearing about the failure of some great man and woman of God. Could it be that non-believers are constantly hearing about how the followers of Christ are supposed to live, but what they're seeing is something totally different? Could it be that people have this expectation that since they've been told that Christ is holy, that they're expecting us to be holy like he is? Could it be that in their minds, the gospel message has no power because the messengers have no power. I want you to know this morning, I'm here not to pound down on you. I'm here not to discourage you, but I am here to challenge you. You are at one of the most, I guess arguably, one of the most prestigious schools, seminaries on planet Earth. This is Dallas Seminary. This is where we develop servant leaders. One of the things that these men and women that are standing on this podium can do, they can control the amount of content that gets in your head. But they can't control your character. They can give you all of the right formulas. They can give you all of the right principles. They can help you to know how to use all the right tools, but they cannot make you take advantage of it. That's on you. You're going to have to make sure that during your time at this school that you not only learn to use your head, but you learn to make sure it touches your heart. The Apostle Paul understood this. He understood it very, very clear. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's here that the Apostle Paul allows us to kind of peek into his heart so we can take a look at his ministry and how his ministry team conducted themselves. I love what chapter 2 says. Paul begins, he says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God 
in the midst of much conflict. The first point I want you to take home today, I want you to put in your spiritual wallet or in your spiritual purse, here's what it is. If we are to make sure that there is a clear merging, there is a oneness, there is a uniting between the message that we preach and the lives that we live, we've gotta make sure. Make sure that you understand that your power for preaching, for your power for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ is grounded in the message of Christ and not your intellect. You know, one of the things that I love to do, my wife can tell you I love to tinker around and I'm one of these guys who is pretty good with his hands. And just the other day I was installing a new television in my upstairs room. I'd done it several times, four or five different televisions over the years. It was no big deal. And so I just pulled the television out and I began to plug up all the wires, make sure the cut cable wires were plugged in the way they, that they were supposed to, made sure it was on the right channel, made sure the cable box was just right. Man, I hit that button and I got a message that said, no signal. Try another input. But see, I mean, I intellectually knew exactly how to fix it because remember now, I've done this many, many times. And after about two hours, <laughs> of trying to hook up this cable, I had to call the professionals. It hurt my heart. <laughs> but I called anyway. A few days later, the cable man came out, and guys, this was so embarrassing. He walked in the house, went to the downstairs cable box, peeked behind it, and he said, the main cable wire to the second TV is unplugged. <laughs> See, I had been working on the second TV upstairs plugging in all the right wires, not realizing that it did no good if the main wires were unplugged. He said, the signal has been sent for the last four days. The problem was that you had no power. I thought about that. You know, I think there's a spiritual lesson there. I intellectually knew exactly what to do. I had experience in hooking up cables. I had experience in installing televisions. The problem was not my intellect. The problem was I lacked power. The Apostle Paul said in this text, I love what he says here. He says, at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God. Ah. It's possible that you can leave Dallas Theological Seminary with false boldness. Boldness in your knowledge of how to install TVs. But no power. Because your dependence is not upon God and his word but it's on your ability. So I want to remind you, I want to challenge you. While you're here at this school, learn, learn as much as you can. But if you don't take what you learn and internalize it and allow it to change you and recognize it's not your strength. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not only that, Paul also wanted to let the Thessalonians know something else, another principle that I think is important, and that is we need to make sure that the purpose or the motivation for our preaching is to please Christ and not people. There's a phrase here that I like. Look at verse 3. He says, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Please underscore that. Entrusted with 
the gospel. I remember as a little boy, my mother would always send me to the corner drugstore. And I love going to the drugstore for my mother because I got a chance to walk and to kick some rocks down the street and kick some cans. It, it, it was so much fun as a kid to walk to the store. The problem was, my mother would always give me a note and she would say in her own way, little Willie Joe, make sure you give the store owner this note because once you do, he'll know exactly what I need. And many times I wanted so bad to open that note and to read it and then just to kind of throw it aside and stand up to that man and tell him from memory exactly what my mother wanted him to do. But I was a good little boy and I would always hand him the note and he would provide what she needed. As I got older, I realized why she gave me the note. It wasn't because she didn't love me. She didn't really trust my little mind to remember all of the things that she needed me to get. My question this morning is, God's given you more than a note. God's given you his word. And he wants you to follow the instructions from his word. He wants you to do what he has told you to do that comes from his word. Here's the question. Can he trust you? Will you be one of those individuals that we read about? Will you be one of those ones who led a great ministry for 10 or 15 and 20 years and we have to read about you in the newspaper? after you've fallen to some moral sin? Can God trust you that you will deliver his word unadulterated, when, that you will share exactly what God says without any doctrine, without any deviation of his word? Can he trust you? That's the question. That's the question that I want you to ponder this morning. Can God trust me with his word. Paul wanted to remind his audience of the type of ministry that he and his team shared while they were in Thessalonica. I've read it already, but let me say it one more time. He says, our appeal does not come from error. It doesn't come from impurity or from any attempt to deceive. But watch the contrast. But to be entrusted with the gospel, it says, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came, he says, go back, think back. Remember when we first came, you know, he says, we never, we never use flattering words. That was interesting to me, so I wanted to do a little research on this word. And I found out that this is not just a word for stroking someone. This is a word that implies changing the message in order to have people have a different opinion of you. We would call it today being politically correct. Can God trust you that you will never try to be politically correct? Now remember, if you leave here and you want a humongous church, ask yourself the question, will it cost any of my integrity to have this great ministry? I was shocked to find out that the average size church in the United States of America is 175 members. And some of you already have it in your head, when I graduate, I'm going to build that 6,000 member church. Now, can you do it? Of course. There are many great men of God that have huge mega ministries and they still maintain their godly integrity. But the question is, in some cases, some of those mega ministries, they are the size they are. Because someone, someone is just using flattering words, saying what people want to hear. 
rather than what God's word says. But not only do we need to make sure that our purpose or our motivation for preaching is to please Christ, but here's the last thing. We need to make sure, we need to make sure beyond the shadow of any doubt, we need to make sure that our, let me get, let me get it here, I've got it. It's somewhere on this paper. Let's see where it is. Is it here? Is it there? There it is. Make sure our passion, <laughs> thank you for showing up. We need to make sure our passion for preaching is from a sincere heart and love for others. This is the part I really like. After Paul gives all these negative things about flattery and about greed and about glory, he says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being effectually desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Why? Because you had become very dear to us. My birthday is on the 4th of July. And because my birthday is on the 4th of July, when I was in grammar school, I was always envious of the kids who could have a birthday party in school. And I would sit with my little hat, little whistle and so forth, and I would always wonder, boy, how great it would be to have a birthday party for me. I'll never forget my 11th birthday, 4th of July, 19... They threw a birthday party just for me. All the friends from the neighborhood, the cake and the ice cream and all the cards, all the well wishes. And I remember I got my first 10-speed bicycle. I mean, I was just jazzed beyond belief. For the next four or five years, I always just was excited when I knew that it was July the 1st because another party was coming up. But can I tell you guys the truth? After I trusted Christ as my savior, whether someone threw a party for me on the 4th of July or not, it didn't matter to me anymore. Because I found that verse of scripture that says, it is more blessed to give than to receive, is so true. I get more jazzed, I get more excited when I can throw a party for someone else. I want you to learn that principle. It doesn't make sense to you right now, but I promise you your greatest joy will be when you see someone who is in the kingdom of darkness. They trust Christ. They come out of darkness into the light and they come to you and they say, thank you. It's more than giving me a million dollars to see someone's life transformed. Paul says, we need to make sure that as we preach and proclaim, that we do it with passion, out of love and affection for other people. You know, I told you earlier that this school is very dear to me. But in closing, I'd like to say this. There are four men that stand out in my mind that my life will forever be indebted to. The first man's name is Jim Holly. He led me to Christ, and I refer to him as my spiritual father. He gave me my lifetime verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that says, whether therefore ye drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. The second name was Jim Franklin. He was my spiritual teacher and mentor. The third name, you might be surprised, it's a man by the name of Howard Hendricks. As a 26-year-old, only three years old in the Lord, Christian, the first voice that I heard from Dallas Theological Seminary was in a Christian education class, and it was the voice of Dr. Howard Hendricks. And I said then, at 26 years old, if I could ever teach like that, that's what I want. 
And for almost 40 years, I've tried to pattern my teaching after what I learned from Dr. Howard Hendricks. The last name that stands out in my mind is Dr. Tony Evans. You see, you need to understand that there was a time, even in our country, where things were kind of difficult for people of color. But when I heard that an African American had graduated from this seminary with honors, and God was using him all over the world to preach the gospel, at 26, I said, that's how I want to preach. I want to preach just like that. So everyone, I leave you today and I want you to remember, make sure, make sure that the power is not your own, it's from God. Make sure that your motives are pure. Make sure that you preach from passion and not just to be a man pleaser. And in the end, I hope what happened for me will happen for you. Because these four men, they get it. You have never heard any scandal, any schism, any negative thing in over 50 years about Dr. Howard Hendricks. And I doubt if you ever will. You know why? You know why you've never heard any negative thing about Tony Evans? Even though you never met Jim Holly and Jim Franklin, you know why you never have heard anything about them and you probably never will? It's because of this. They learned early to merge the message of Christ with their conduct as the messengers of Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we never forget, we as messengers have no power apart from the message of Christ. It's in your name we pray, amen.